So I'm delighted to be here and have a chance to share just a little bit of, of the work we've been doing. And I'm going to dive into uh, one topic in particular, uh, the dematerialization of the economy and what it means when we move from creating value mostly with atoms to mostly with bits. And there are a couple of, uh, of big implications of that that I'm going to talk about. One of them has to do with uh, measurement and one of them has to do with how the uh, uh, benefits are allocated. So uh, driving around San Francisco, I actually saw this, this warehouse, and there was a, a, an article about it as well, that the hottest industry right now is apparently storing all this physical stuff. So we buy it and we store it, and I don't know, maybe Amazon's next uh, purchase will be some of these warehouses so you can ship it directly from. <laughs> <laughs> that would be optimal, really highly efficient. Um, but. Um, so, but these, there are these two implications um, of dematerializing. One of them is that um, our measurement edifice, I don't think it's very well understood, is really not based on measuring our well-being or welfare, even though that's the way it's traditionally used. GDP, productivity, national accounts, all the stats that get reported to six or eight or ten significant digits with great enthusiasm aren't measuring what we think they're measuring. And I'll talk a bit about that. And secondly, there's this issue of, of rise of winner-take-all markets. When uh, goods are digitized, um, there are some characteristics that be, can be uh, produced at close to zero marginal cost. Each copy is a perfect replica of the original. And they can be transmitted anywhere on the planet essentially instantaneously, speed of light. So free, perfect, instant aren't three adjectives we use to describe traditional goods and services, but they're standard for digital goods, and they have very different implications for, for allocation. For instance, winner take all or winner take most markets. Let me talk about the first one. Um, so one example is that this is an ad from the early uh, 1990s, all sorts of stuff you could buy and store in a warehouse or use. And what's interesting is essentially everything on that ad, in that ad is now available in your smartphone, and a, and a lot more. You can get your, a computer, far more powerful computer, um, a better uh, camera, a better video camera, an answering machine, if any of you guys remember what that was, um, clock radio, I, this morning, that's how I woke up, and all sorts of other stuff. And it's all, once you have a smartphone, it's essentially bundled in automatically, usually for free, as it. And so what are some of the implications of that? It's not just that, um, but there's a whole set of goods now that, uh, this whole economy, uh, they're the five most valuable companies in the economy, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, Alphabet, and uh, Microsoft, a big part of their value is from these digital goods. Um, so what has it done to GDP? We've had this explosion of free goods. Well, um, back in uh, the early 80s, uh, the information share of the economy was about 4.7%, and now it is uh, well, about 4.7%. So despite this explosion of goods, it's not showing up anywhere in GDP. Now, it could be that they don't really do anything, or it could be that our GDP measures aren't really capturing um, all these free goods. Um, and to give you a more of a specific case example, let's look at smartphones. Um, so you know, we can measure that pretty well. There are about 80 billion photos taken in the year 2000, uh, most of them analog. Um, last year, there were 1.6 trillion photos taken, 20 times as many. Um, some measures of, re real, if you really measured the contribution to real GDP, you might think that there should be 50 times as big a contribution, but the price went from 50 cents to zero, so in fact, the contribution fell from that. It doesn't show up in the GDP measures. Um, and it doesn't show up in the camera measures either, because the camera production, while it, digital cameras went up for a while, those are also falling, and of course, that's because they're all being absorbed into, into this device. Um, which essentially is a combination of a phone and a camera and many other things, but in the official government statistics, it's not counted that way. They don't make any kind of a quality adjustment to account for the fact that it has these new capabilities. So when we measure GDP and we talk about whether it's 3.2% growth or whatever it is, um, people use that as a shorthand for how we're doing. Uh, and, and productivity, by the way, is directly based on GDP. It's essentially the numerator of productivity is GDP. The denominator is hours worked. So if GDP is mismeasured, productivity is going to be mismeasured. Um, this is a real issue. If you go back to Simon Kuznets, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist who invented GDP, he developed it back in the 1930s, one of the great inventions of the 20th century, he said, please, please 
do not use this as a measure of our welfare <laughs> or well-being. So he was quite aware of these <laughs> issues. But nonetheless, we very quickly ignored that advice and, and have been using it that way. So what should we be doing? I think there are many alternative approaches. I'll describe one that we're working on at MIT, which is to estimate what the value that consumers are getting um, compared to what they actually have to pay, which is called consumer surplus. And you can do this in other ways. For instance, one way to do it is with uh, what we call massive online discrete choice experiments or conjoint experiments. An example of that would be something like this. Um, we could ask you, let's just do it right now. How many people here, you could either give up Facebook for one month and get paid $1, or you could keep Facebook and get no payment? How many people would choose option one? OK. And how many people would choose option two? OK. So we see that some people choose either. And we could choose different numbers. We could choose $5, $10, $100. And different numbers of hands would go up. I won't do that right now. But you can get a sense of this gives you some sense of what people's uh, willingness is for different kinds of goods. Now imagine doing that for hundreds of thousands or millions of people with hundreds of thousands of different um, choice experiments. That's essentially what we did. So we've been running these experiments. And we didn't do it just by having people raise their hands. That would be a little tedious. Fortunately, the, the digital economy helps us. So you can do these uh, uh, Google consumer surveys and ask people, would you give up Facebook, in this case, you know, for a month and get paid $5? And we have many, many of those experiments running. And when we run them, what we do is we find that we can get some valuations for different things. I think Facebook is sort of in the middle there, sort of a little bit above breakfast cereal. <laughs> and a little bit below music streaming. We had some dollar amounts in there as well. So you can start getting a sense of what people's valuations are. Now this actually is textbook economics, what consumer surplus, what the welfare is. And we have, we're hopeful that we'll be able to get much better indications. My good friend Bob Gordon has uh, emphasized that toilets are one of the great inventions. And in, in I guess the survey says he's right. People do like them quite a bit, <laughs> although internet is close. I'm not sure which some, there's some people who are willing to give up toilets for internet. I don't know how many are in this room. Um, so the other thing I want to just briefly touch on is this uh, winner-take-all phenomenon. So I mentioned free, perfect, and instant digital goods. One of the economic effects of that is that you tend to have winner-take-all or winner-take-most markets. If you develop, if you have high fixed costs and low marginal costs, um, it often is dominant just to have one company. And the same is true if you have strong network effects. And so, as I mentioned, the five of the five uh, most valuable companies um, are now mainly digital platform companies. Um, and it's true for individuals as well. If you are a really good singer or entertainer or uh, like Scott Cook on the right there, you develop some really valuable software like uh, TurboTax, there's no better time in history to be able to do that. You can take your uh, talent or your ideas, or your good luck, whatever combination it is, and replicate it to uh, thousands, millions, in some cases, billions of people. And that's super, super valuable. And that's why we have more millionaires and billionaires. That's part of why we have more millionaires and billionaires today, people who have become these digital winners. Of course, if you're on the other side of that, if you used to be competing in that market, and now there's a, a digital goods that, re that replaces you, um, that may not be such a good outcome. And in fact, we've seen that the income distribution has become much more skewed. You know, the press sometimes talks about the 1%. Well, the 1% has their own 1%, the 0.01%. And the share of income that's going to them has been rising steadily. And it's not an all-time high, matched only by just before the Great Depression, if that's any source of comfort. Um, and again, there are a number of reasons why that's happening. But uh, we're quite convinced that part of the reason is the digitization, the dematerialization of the economy that leads to a very different kind of economics, very different kind of market structure. So I'm just about out of time. So let me just leave it there. I'm sure we'll get a chance to pick up on some of these issues some more in the discussion. Thanks very much. <laughs>